ACU TV proudly presents On Campus with your host, ACU Vice President and Dean of Campus Life, Dr. Gary McCaleb. Here's Gary. Yes, today we're pleased to welcome Dr. Arthur Holmes, the Chairman of the Philosophy Department at Wheaton College, as well as the author of the book, The Idea of a Christian College. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us today, Dr. Well, it's Holmes. good to be here. Your, uh, your book, The Idea of a Christian College, I think uh, will sort of provide a basis for our discussion today because you've dealt very straightforwardly with uh, a number of issues that I think have long been uh, concerns of people both within the Christian college, uh, colleges of America as well as those who sometimes use uh, various uh, points to attack. Uh, yes, I hope so at least. Them as well. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it would be good for us to just start with the historical perspective uh, because uh, the idea of a Christian college is not really a new idea, but was an idea at the beginning, I suppose, in a way, or a, a college that had a religious yes. orientation to it. Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Yes, and even before that, in fact, if you go back well, to the medieval university, there theology was the queen of the sciences, mm -hmm. capstoning, mm -hmm. giving some sense of direction mm -hmm. to the whole process. So, so it should not be thought of as being uh, uh, a new and therefore problematical uh, combination by, of putting by no means. religious with the yes. university. In fact, if you trace the history of higher education in America, uh, the two main sources from which colleges, universities sprang, one was land-grant universities, mm -hmm. which became agricultural colleges, eventually state universities, Mm -hmm. The other, church-related institutions. Mm -hmm. Harvard, Yale, Princeton are natural examples. And then as the westward expansion took place, so the various religious communities as they migrated would establish their own church-related colleges in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Down here you have the Churches of Christ. If you go to the Pacific Northwest, you find a Quaker institution mm -hmm. because of Quaker communities. And you can trace um, that sort of development nationwide. But you know, from the historical perspective, there is a disturbing uh, observation, at least in my mind, and that is that many of those colleges that still exist, that began with a strong religious orientation, have since at least departed moved from away, that. if not entirely departed from. Yes, I, I think you have to put that within the context of religious history in this country. The, uh, the shift from the Puritan tradition in New England, the growing Unitarian movement. Uh, 19th century, the inroads of German liberal theology so that you get a gradual watering down of the distinctives of the Christian faith historically, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, tended to erode the religious distinctives of the church-related colleges. So now, as uh, you indicate, there are major universities which were once Christian colleges, but now are no different from the state U. Let me ask uh, a couple of hypothetical questions yep. that, that people, does that suggest, for example, when we mention Harvard, Yale, Princeton yes. today, people would put those, or at least admit those would be on any list of the great academic institutions right. of America. Right. Does that mean they could not have become those great academic institutions and stayed true to those original moorings mm -hmm. of morality well, and I religion? I think there are two questions packed into that. One is the some historical necessity that in the process of time an institution will shift ground. Mm -hmm. No, I don't believe so. Uh, I don't believe in historical determinism. Mm -hmm. uh, history is shaped in large measure by human beings, and their behavior is not determined by rigid laws of history. There's responsibility for individual actions. But is it uh, impossible to become academically outstanding and at the same time religiously committed? Is it impossible to be both? Mm -hmm. And again, I don't think so. Uh, one can cite cases of individual scholars, scientists, people in the humanities, in whatever field, who are at the cutting edge of their field, 
world-class scholars, and at the same time religiously committed. If there is no incompatibility in the individual, why is there any incompatibility institutionally, provided the institution knows what it's doing and tries to do it well? Mm -hmm. And yet, the observation has been made that very few colleges or universities have existed beyond a 100th anniversary and continued to hold true to the, or at least to the, the degree of commitment yes, that you were talking about Yes, but I there. think that in measure is part of that religious history story. There are exceptions. My institution has just celebrated its 125th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I've been there long enough to remember as we were approaching the centennial, there were all sorts of prophets of doom warning about what would happen by the time we were 100 years old. Now we're 125 years old, mm -hmm. and it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it's necessary at all. Mm -hmm. um, it takes careful guidance and wise administration. And the key, I suspect, is in the faculty selection, faculty development aspect of the institution. That's the key to the whole educational business. Mm -hmm. Let's shift a little bit to, to another perspective, the okay. perspective of the, the parents of high school young people at the present time who are wrestling with the difficult decision of what kind of college or university for my son or daughter to attend, yes. as well as that son or daughter themselves dealing with that question. Uh, there are obviously some, some very key contrasts that can be mm -hmm. made and yes. that would be made yes. as a person evaluates that kind of decision-making process. The, in some cases, the, the very, the very uh, quickest ones we would come to would be the financial differences sometimes in right. cost right. and things like that. But getting past those, getting to what am I going to realize or benefit, uh, what is this going to do for me or mm -hmm. how is it? How would you suggest that yeah. that process should properly be evaluated? Well, in the first place, I don't want to suggest that everybody or even everybody from some Christian background should necessarily attend a Christian college. Uh, there are obvious benefits both routes, and the alternatives need to be carefully weighed. But I think there are distinctive benefits in a Christian college. Um, First, I'd, I'd suggest that the major benefit is not in protecting the young person. Mm. Uh, and I Which think is that sometimes said, yes. sought. Yes. yes. Now, there may be some degree of uh, protection from the intellectual allurements that might beset a kid in a university or the moral atmosphere of the university. But if we take seriously the Christian doctrine of human sin, we recognize that temptation comes as much from within as from without. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that you have um, a community largely Christians does not automatically uh, mean that um, protection is complete. No, I don't think the purpose of education in any case is protection. The purpose is education. Right. And uh, there, the distinct advantage of the Christian college, it seems to me, is that the things that happen to the student in her development as a person, in the shaping of her mind, her values, her outlook on life, uh, those things are influenced profoundly by the, uh, the Christian ethos of the institution her thinking influenced by the way in which religious perspectives can pervade the curriculum and be overt in the classroom. Um, yet, this is not indoctrination. There's an important distinction between indoctrination, you must believe this, and education. Now, here are some alternatives to explore, where the Christian professor will say, my own preference for certain reasons is here. I see these problems. Now, there are problems with my position, but you've got to work this through for yourself. 
but there is the positive guidance that comes from a mentor. Mm. Um, and ideally, the student feels like a junior colleague exploring the same issues. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you suggest in your book that there is a very close affiliation, I suppose I might say, between the idea of a Christian education and a liberal arts education yes. or a yes. liberal education. Um, would you like to comment on that or expand yeah. on that first yeah. before I go on with the... It seems to me the starting point for Christian attitude towards life and learning is the conviction that our God is the creator of everything. That the arts and the sciences are simply developments of possibilities that God has implanted within his creation. That being so, uh, there can be no uh, dichotomy between the secular and the sacred. Uh, so it is as much an exploring of the world that God has given us, given us to live in, to work with, to steward, to work in the sciences, the arts, the humanities, as to work in uh, religious disciplines and to pursue that angle. Uh, moreover, the, uh, the Christian has a mandate in life for which he must prepare, which goes significantly beyond earning a living. Uh, there are a variety of action outcomes of a young person's education. The family, involvement in the economic sphere, work, business, the body politic, the community, mm -hmm. the church, the community of faith, the aesthetic realm, which is an essential ingredient of human existence, mm -hmm. God-given. Now, all of these are areas in which we should prepare ourselves more effectively to glorify the Creator who is our Redeemer. We have that responsibility. So I, I see a, a Christian mandate by virtue of the wholeness of God's creation, to explore the creation as a whole, to be good stewards in the creation as a whole. And yet, it seems that one observing the academic scene today might easily conclude that we have moved away from as much of an emphasis and an appreciation for the liberal arts mm -hmm. education as being the, the goal of the college student, yes, as we had in years past. Yeah, but you know that these things come in eddies and waves. Yeah. Um, there are student generations uh -huh. with particular interests. And the current social economic conditions affect the emphases that are being made. Mm -hmm. uh, think of when the Russians launched Sputnik and the uh, boom that that created in scientific education all of a sudden. Uh, now we've been going through some economic hard times. And understandably, the emphasis has been upon um, preparation for job opportunities, job training. Right. But we're still human beings. And human existence is broader than, than all of this. In fact, if uh, you um, examine some of the recent literature on higher education, it becomes noticeable that there is at least the beginning of a trend back towards an appreciation of liberal education. The kind of liberal learning that is being injected into the educational pattern, for instance, in um, institutes of technology. The recognition that we have to have educated technicians rather than simply manipulators of mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason being the value judgments that have to be made. In a mm -hmm. technological society, we're not dealing simply with impersonal facts and mechanical processes. We're dealing with those, but we're dealing with people, with the future of our society. Mm -hmm with the natural environment. 
We need to take a break here for just a minute, but when we okay. come back, I want us to pursue this a little further, the idea of the importance of preparation for a career and its relationship to education. Good. We're visiting with Dr. Arthur Holmes. What is the ACU difference? For Greg Holt, senior drama major from Hearst, it's the faculty. I'm very satisfied with the education I've received here. Not only have I learned a lot from some of these professors, but what makes it so nice is that they're Christians who care about me and are willing to spend time and talk to me as a person. The ACU difference can make a difference for you. For more information, call 674-2000. We're back on campus and continuing to visit with Dr. Arthur F. Holmes, chairman of the philosophy department at Wheaton College, as well as the author of a book, The Idea of a Christian College. You, uh, you mention at one point uh, an interesting combination of questions about the way a person might evaluate the importance of education or the relationship that the student might have to education. You said the question really is not, what can I do with it, but rather should be, what will it do to me? Would you amplify a little bit on the, the uh, idea, yes. the thought behind those yes, questions? Yes, I'm trying to make a distinction between training and education. Now, obviously, there are aspects of training involved in education, training the mind and so forth. Uh, but uh, training we undertake because of certain particular activities that we have to perform were trained to do certain jobs. And so the appropriate question there is, what can I do with this? Now, if education were just training, that would be the only question. But education is concerned about the development of a whole person, the development of our humanness, what it is to be a man, a woman, in society today, and for the Christian college, what it is and what responsibility is likely to come to a Christian man, a Christian woman in society today. So the question there is not what can I do with it, but what can it do to me in terms of shaping, developing, uh, drawing out capacities which God has given, informing the understanding, cultivating skills, does that suggest then that it may be possible for a student today who is so preoccupied with career preparation that they might spend four years at a college or university and really have not gotten an education at all, only training? Precisely. Precisely. And moreover, they may have gained training in an area which is changing so rapidly mm -hmm. that they will be um, outmoded within a decade. Mm -hmm. In um, these days of advancing computer technology, for instance, that sort of thing is happening very quickly. How would you respond to the question of a, a, a genuinely concerned parent or student, high school, yes. senior, who is serious about uh, a successful life, productive life, who feels a real sense of responsibility to to, to utilize that college education as the springboard into a good job. Mm -hmm. Yes. And therefore, yes. Ho uh, hopefully, a successful career. Well, first, by all means, build into your education, electively or otherwise, uh, the kind of coursework which will provide first steps in at least one, but preferably a number of possible career directions. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind the distinction between a job and a career. A job can be a temporary thing. It can be a long-lasting thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is a lot of job mobility in our society in two senses. Uh, changes that take place within one and the same job. I've been teaching in the same institution for nearly 35 years. Uh, haven't I seen changes? <laughs> haven't I had the change? Of course. But changes of jobs, whole career changes. No, I think of education as preparation for a lifetime's career with the kind of mobility that is involved. I have a friend, for instance, who in college was a chemistry major. His graduate work was in chemistry. He became a research chemist. For a while, he taught chemistry. 
He went back into industry, in research. He became uh, the head of a research team. From that, he moved into personnel management of the professional people in this corporation. He found himself dealing with labor problems. In his late 50s, he went to law school, recently completed a law degree. He was a man who had the education which enabled him to move throughout his career in a variety of directions, taking on new responsibilities mm -hmm. and gaining further education as it became necessary. Mm -hmm. No, career is larger than the idea of job preparation. Right. Shifting a little bit to a slightly different theme, but still on the idea of a Christian college, yes. you, uh, you treat uh, quite a bit in your book the idea of the of perceiving the university or the college as a community uh, and the value that yes. that has in the, yes. uh, in the educational process. Uh, are, are you concerned that, uh, or is there a possibility that as a college grows larger, its ability to function in that community sort of way diminishes? Oh, undoubtedly, yes. Uh, studies that I've seen suggest that there is a maximal sort of size for retaining a sense of community as a whole, four to five thousand, something of that sort. One gets much beyond that and you um, uh, become depersonalized or else fragmented in the sense that separate communities become insulated. It's hard to get the whole academic community together for convocation or in a Christian college for worship if it gets much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Community is important. Why is community important? Uh, I, I think perhaps um, for two reasons at least. One, we are by nature social beings, relational beings. We're not isolated atoms tucked away by ourselves but we find our identity in relationship with other people. And then we act out that identity that we find. So the kind of community that I am part of contributes to my um, developing personal identity, mm -hmm. who I am, what I'm becoming. That involves the second thing, the shaping of our values. Values are not primarily transmitted through uh, simply a cognitive um, academic process. Uh, they're caught more than they're taught. Mm. Um, like love is caught, yeah. uh, infectious. To value something is to love it. And um, that kind of valuing is, um, I is contagious within a community. Um, I, I suspect that one of the signal influences on the college student is um, her own peer group, that aspect of the community. Or again, how many times have you heard it said that a certain individual has uh, taken on some of the ideals of a certain professor mm -hmm. whose enthusiasm for certain things has inspired, captivated? Mm -hmm. When you speak of community, uh, are, are you including then uh, not only the faculty and the student, but the staff, the administration, the, all parts of what come yes, together to make a university? I think so, and in varying degrees. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, um, uh, persons who, while employed in the institution, have no contact with students, mm -hmm. and there are always some, have relatively little influence on them, mm -hmm. except indirectly, uh, through what they're doing. Uh, but uh, certainly the people who work, for instance, in, uh, in food service, or in the offices on campus, or in maintenance tasks, these are part of the community and need to be regarded as such. Um, they, um, they need to learn to prize uh, their role in an institution and their part in making it a community. You, you uh, alluded a while ago to the idea of teaching values. There, there is some thinking today that, you know, m morals, ethics, values should not be taught uh, within a, a well, school system. Well, that strikes me as itself a value judgment. 
It is, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, that, because my question was going to be, is it possible really to teach without well, teaching? Is there any kind of human activity, human relationship, which does not have moral aspects to it? Yes, I We ignore those moral aspects and we're saying they're not important. Mm -hmm. There's the value judgment. No, it seems to me we can do two things with, um, with the values um, uh, involved in uh, the educational material. One is to ignore them, which is um, saying that it's not important and we don't care for that aspect of education. Uh, the other is to bring them to the surface, bring them out into the open, and uh, make room in the curriculum and the classroom for an open discussion of value conflicts, moral issues that they arise. I'm not convinced, even though I teach ethics, I'm not convinced that the only place is in the ethics course. Mm -hmm. Ethics is right. far too important to be left to ethicists, mm -hmm. you see. Moral issues need to be addressed where they arise. In your book, you also make the statement, we need to get back to the basics. I'm wondering, do you perceive the basics that you're talking about there for the Christian college to be the same basics that would lie at the heart of any educational approach? Are the basics for a Christian education different in any way? Um, the same and yet additional. The same in the sense that there are foundational questions that arise in regards to the various disciplines in any institution. Um, you cannot work in the natural sciences without raising questions about the nature and limitations of scientific explanation. You cannot work in sociology without um, raising questions about the, um, the basic nature of um, human beings, and so on and so forth. There are these basics we have to get down to. But in a Christian institution, it seems to me, those basics are going to be informed by one's theological understanding and by one's ethical principles. Mm -hmm. And those, those two aspects, it seems to me, are crucial and in many ways distinctive in the, the work of the Christian college. In the concern over maintaining, once a Christian college has been established, yes. What would you point to as being the keys to maintaining a Christian college that is true to its original, original purposes? Yes. Um, variety of things. Uh, one, uh, maintaining a faculty that is committedly Christian and is committed to the task of educating Christianly. I think that's crucial. Mm -hmm perhaps the most crucial, the central thing. Mm -hmm. We only have one minute left, if you can summarize the rest of those in some way. Well, I think, secondly, the administration of the college and the trustees must be educated, and administrators and trustees need to be educated about the distinctive opportunities and mission of the Christian college. I think that combination of trustee, administration, faculty, understanding, and commitment to the task Mm -hmm. promises the, That's the conservation key. of the mm -hmm. mission. It's been a pleasure to have the chance to visit with you about an extremely important topic on this campus and one I think it's important to our entire country. And uh, thank you for the thinking that you've done on this subject and the book that you've written and the work that you're doing in this area and for being with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for thank being you. with us on campus with Dr. Arthur F. Holmes. We need to sit for just a few more minutes.